You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. Freedom is all about choices. And while there is only one Jeep brand, you have the freedom to choose from an epic lineup of Jeep brand vehicles. Hit the trails with a versatile classic, the Jeep Gladiator, or experience the wild in style with the sophistication and comfort of the Jeep Grand Cherokee or Jeep Grand Cherokee 4xe. Looking for a more immersive experience? Let nature come to you in the open-air Jeep Wrangler or Jeep Wrangler 4xE, America's best-selling plug-in hybrid. Whatever you choose, adventure is just one drive away. Visit Jeep.com for details. Based on 2022 CYQ4 sales, GD Power retail sales data, Jeep is a registered trademark. It's a long way to Tipperary. It's a long way. Hello everyone and welcome to History of the Great War episode 230. This week a big thank you goes out to John and Ryan for their support of the podcast on Patreon, where they now get access to special ad-free versions of all of these episodes, plus special Patreon-only episodes released once a month. If you would like to find out more, head on over to patreon.com slash historyofthegreatwar to find out more information. While the Weimar government in Germany had been trying to solidify its position within the country, while at the same time trying to balance external obligations, it was also trying to work through one of those obligations that was thrust upon Germany in the Treaty of Versailles, the reparations payments. The largest recipients of these reparations were France and Belgium. To say that they were displeased with the size and timeliness of Germany's reparations payments would be a massive understatement. For the first several years of reparations, the German government would pay the absolute least amount possible, to the consternation of the countries on the receiving end of those payments. Eventually, the French and Belgians would become frustrated enough that they would take action, and on January 11, 1923, a combined Franco-Belgian force would march into the Ruhr. The goal was to make up the reparations payments by forcefully confiscating coke and coal, which the Ruhr region had plenty of, and which had been explicitly included as part of those reparations payments in the treaty. Due to the Treaty of Versailles, the Germans had almost no military, and when the French and Belgians arrived, they couldn't really actively resist their occupation. Without the option for a military response, but also not wanting to give in to their demands, the German leaders instituted a policy of passive resistance. Workers and public officials in French-occupied areas didn't fight the French, but they also did their best to slow and prevent the French from accomplishing their goals. This resistance would be successful for several months, but it would eventually be economically disastrous for the region and very hard on the people who lived there. Eventually, the Germans would be forced to give in to French demands, which seemed like a victory for the French at the time, but it wouldn't really work out for them in the long run. Due to the fact that the Ruhr Crisis has its roots in the Treaty of Versailles and in the French views of that treaty, it's worth reviewing why reparations, and specifically some of the non-monetary reparation requirements, were so important to the French. Even though they'd been on the winning side of the war, the French were deeply concerned about the future, and in no realm was those concerns more pressing than in the economy. The French economy, and specifically its manufacturing and coal industry, had been devastated by the First World War. Before the war, most of France's industrial and coal output had been based in areas that would be devastated between 1914 and 1918. Most of it had spent most of the war behind German lines, who had damaged it during the occupation. The French hope was that reparation payments would allow for the investments necessary to repair that damage and to restart the French manufacturing. In the short term, they also hoped that by forcing the Germans to give them reparations in the form of coal and coke deliveries, that they would be able to sort of bridge the gap between the French needs in 1919 and the point where the French mines would be back into full production and would help meet those needs. It should also be said here that these reparations and these deliveries of goods were also designed as punishment for Germany, and were at least partially put in place to slow German economic growth in the post-war years. However, the German government was not exactly timely with their reparations payments of any kind, and they were constantly late or not providing the agreed-upon amounts. In Berlin, they would constantly claim that they could not make the payments, which allowed Germany to negotiate smaller payments in both 1921 and 1922. 
During each of these negotiations, the French were constantly at odds with other nations, but they would give in. But no matter how much the payments were reduced, the Germans were still seemingly always incapable of meeting them. These facts, for obvious reasons, frustrated the French leaders, and therefore in late 1922, discussions began about how to compel the Germans to up their payments. The obvious answer was a military occupation of Germany, but a full occupation just wasn't really possible. But an occupation of a specific region could work. And if there was a specific region that could be occupied by French troops, it was the Ruhr, the heart of German industry and coal mining. On November 27, 1922, President Millerand would give the military permission to begin preparations for just such an operation. There was one problem with the plan, though. To launch an occupation of Germany, a military action against another nation in Europe, France had to get other countries to go along with it. The most important of these countries was Britain. The French and British met in London on December 9th and 10th to discuss possible options. The French made their case, but the British were concerned. They fully understood why the French wanted to pursue this course, and they hoped that it might help with reparations payments, but they were concerned about the possible outcomes of an occupation. The first item on this list of concerns is that the British did not, under any circumstances, want to get involved in any long-term military occupation of any part of Germany outside of the small area given to them by the Treaty of Versailles. Any expansion of this occupation was bound to cost more money than they were willing to spend, and it would damage relations with Germany. One of the top priorities in London at this point was to improve relations with Germany for economic reasons, but the primary driver for British positions during these negotiations with the French was the desire to, under no circumstances, be pulled into the occupation. The conference in London would not bring the two governments into an agreement, and therefore they would meet in Paris in early January. Here the French were able to make it clear that they were supported by the Belgians and the Italians, but the British still withheld their support. This would be only the beginning of a very delicate balancing act for the British Foreign Office during the Ruhr Crisis that followed. Even though they'd not been able to convince the British to assist, the French still pushed forward with their plans. On December 26th, the Reparations Commission declared that Germany had defaulted on payments and deliveries. The French would use this declaration as a pretense for their invasion. After the declaration by the commission, negotiations began between German representatives and the Allies, but it was rapidly becoming clear that negotiations were only a formality. Even while they were ongoing, the French General de Gaulle, who was stationed in the Rhineland, was already preparing for his invasion. While the French military leaders were ready and willing to move forward with the occupation, there was some debate about the details of what the French plan should be. Some wanted to occupy the entire Ruhr region, but Foch and other leaders were concerned that they didn't have the resources to take over that much territory. Various other proposed schemes were put forward. Some involved focusing solely on the major cities like Essen and Dusseldorf. Others suggested that the city should be ignored, and instead it should focus on the less populated areas. De Gaulle would eventually choose this final option, with an emphasis on controlling many of the areas outside of the major cities, which he felt better utilized his very finite resources. On January 10th, the German ambassador in Paris would be given official notification of what was about to happen. Part of this notification stated, quote, the measure in questions are being taken on the basis of paragraph 18, Annex 2 of Section uh, 8 of the Treaty of Versailles. France has no intention thereby of engaging in a military operation or an occupation of a political nature. May I express the hope that the German government will not lay any obstacles in the way of these measures. End quote. On January 11th, at dawn, French and Belgian forces would begin to move into the region. They would begin from the bridgeheads that had been provided to them across the Rhine River in the Treaty of Versailles, bridgeheads designed specifically to allow an invasion of Germany if it was necessary. In this initial advance into the Ruhr, the French and Belgian forces mostly stayed within the demilitarized zone, which meant that they stayed relatively close to the border. The Germans could do nothing to slow or stop them, and so all German units were told to retreat if they were approached by French or Belgian forces. The invading troops would utilize local resources during the occupation, which meant billeting in local houses and requisitioning local goods, activities that would begin shortly after the invasion, and which did little to endear them to the locals. In the Ruhr, there was some Germans who wanted to resist the occupation, but at this early stage there were also large numbers who absolutely did not want to do anything to risk turning the occupation into a violent one. This generally kept those more rambunctious citizens in line. And as soon as the troops had completed their advances, on the first day, de Gaulle 
announced the Inter-Allied Mission for Control of Factories and Mines, or MICOM. The MICOM would be the group that would control all economic actions in the Ruhr. They would control how much and what type of items that would be produced and given over to the French. They would determine the quotas expected from the mines, everything. Much like the citizens in the Ruhr, at this initial stage, the factory and mine owners and workers were mostly prepared to go along with what the French were demanding. Throughout the crisis period, the months and months that it dragged on, both sides would try to sway both public and international opinion, painting themselves as the victims of the other side. The French would focus on the lack of reparations payments and the fact that the Germans had occupied so much French territory during the war, and now they were just trying to get what was owed to them. The Germans would claim that what the French were about to do was a breach of the treaty and that they were claiming to be upholding. The official German line, as communicated to the international community, was that they just wanted peace, and they would therefore begin a campaign of peaceful resistance. A note would be delivered to the French which read, quote, We cannot defend ourselves against violence, but we are not willing to submit to this violation of the peace and still less to collaborate in the execution of French objectives as is being demanded. This note was mostly aimed at other countries, trying to appeal to them to put pressure on the French. The most important of these countries was, of course, Britain. In the meantime, German leaders told mine owners and operators that no coal or coke should be given over to the occupiers, and this would mark the beginning of passive resistance, and the French would have to resort to threats. These threats, as threats often do, then led to arrests, which began on January 16th when six mining directors were summoned to appear before a court-martial for refusing to obey orders from Mikem. The next day, the directors, with the support of the trade unions, released a public statement that they would no longer obey any orders of the occupiers. This caused the French to arrest several mining directors and local political leaders. Local leaders were heavily targeted during these arrests, often for the dual purpose of both removing the leaders, of course, but then also opening their position for more reliable individuals to take their place. It started with local political leaders, but then spiraled out into police officers, postal workers, railway workers, everybody who held a position of power. Some of these individuals were not necessarily arrested, but instead simply expelled from the occupied zone and forced to go anywhere else in Germany. By October, 130,000 individuals would be expelled from the Ruhr, and this does not include the thousands that would be imprisoned. They also began to move their troops uh, out of the demilitarized zone so that they could take more direct control of the mining operations. In response to these actions, the first set of strikes began. Over the next week, the strikes would spread to several mines. On January 20th, a joint statement was made by the four largest mining unions, stating, quote, If our appeal is not heeded, then any orderly production of coal is out of the question, and disruption of economic life will become unavoidable. The peaceful population of the Ruhr district refuses emphatically to work under the bayonets of foreign soldiers. End quote. These actions, a refusal to work with the French, was enthusiastically supported from Berlin, and the Weimar government agreed to pay the wages of the miners, even while they were on strike. The one truth about human history is that change is inevitable. But the one thing that has never changed is that humans need food to survive. There are many ways to get that food, but one of the easiest ones is Factor. Factor delivers ready-to-eat meals right to your door. All you have to do is heat them up and dig in. In two minutes, you can be eating tasty keto or vegan options or any of their 35 options that they have available every week. So you can choose maybe the cheesy garden herb chicken, maybe the Santa Fe green chili beef skillet, or perhaps the Caribbean spiced tofu. It is all delicious, and if you have a bit of a sweet tooth, Factor still has you covered with a wide range of snack and smoothie options. Chocolate mocha cheesecake, snickerdoodle macaroons, any of that sound good? And don't worry, even the tasty stuff is dietitian approved. Head over to factormeals.com gw50 and use code GW50 to get 50% off. That's code GW50 at factormeals.com slash GW50 to get 50% off. Freedom is all about choices, and while there is only one Jeep brand, you have the freedom to choose from an epic lineup of Jeep brand vehicles. Hit the trails with a versatile classic, the Jeep Gladiator, or experience the wild in style with the sophistication and comfort of the Jeep Grand Cherokee, or Jeep Grand Cherokee 4xE. 
Looking for a more immersive experience? Let nature come to you in the Open Air Jeep Wrangler or Jeep Wrangler 4xe, America's best-selling plug-in hybrid. Whatever you choose, adventure is just one drive away. Visit Jeep.com for details. Based on 2022 CYQ4 sales, GD Power retail sales data. Jeep is a registered trademark. The French had always known that some level of local resistance was possible, but as the strikes would continue in the opening weeks of the occupation, discussions began in Paris about how to move forward. During the opening weeks of the campaign, there was incredibly strong resistance from the people in the Ruhr to do anything that would be seen as working with the French. For example, here is the response given to a French commander who asked if his soldiers could use the pit baths at, at a local mine. Quote, Working class families are suffering great poverty and deprivation because of the occupation, problems which were already present in sufficient measure beforehand. We have had our belly full of incursions into our jurisdiction, the constraints on our freedom of assembly, the practical attacks on peaceful citizens, the treacherous shooting of minors. We demand freedom, work, and bread, but you have brought hunger, deprivation, misery, and decay. We didn't invite you, nor do we want you here. We have demonstrated through years of overtime that we support our government's fulfillment policy. You have substituted violence for justice, sanctions for fulfillment. Our defensive struggle has flared up in response to this. It is the duty of our workforce to support this defensive struggle. We therefore demand that our management and our works council never consent under any circumstances to foreign troops bathing here. End quote. In response to the intransigence and also the hardships experienced by the local populations, the French put in place a, a carrot-and-stick approach to try and solve the problem. On one hand, they began to put in place a system of taxation on both individual and local governments. They also limited the ability of people to move around within the Ruhr, and many public services were shut down. At the same time, the French introduced food kitchens, a critical step given the lack of food during the occupation. Many local children were also evacuated out of the area and into unoccupied areas of Germany. While these steps were being taken in the Ruhr, there was also conversations in Paris about the political paths forward, some ideas that were suggested including separating the Ruhr from the rest of Germany until a sufficient amount of reparations had been paid. This idea gained some momentum as the occupation continued, due to the almost wholesale replacement of the local government with one far more favorable to the French. This broke the political links between the Ruhr and Berlin. However, such a drastic action like a long-term occupation or the separating of the Ruhr from the rest of Germany was always going to be difficult for the French and Belgians because they would have to gain support from other nations, which really was not there. These more radical options were thought to be possibly necessary because between January and March 1923, passive resistance in the Ruhr was making it very difficult for the French. The entire goal of the occupation was to extract reparations payments in coal and coke, but during the three months of January, February, and March, deliveries of both were lower than they had been before the occupation began. Between the middle of January and the end of March, the Ruhr mines should have extracted something like 4.2 million tons of coal and coke. However, during the occupation, over that span, they delivered only 238,000 tons. Not only were the total deliveries down, but before the occupation, the Ruhr had exported a large quantity of coal and coke to France, not just for reparations payments, but, but you know, stuff that's, that was paid for by French uh, organizations. This was a critical source of these materials for French factories, and by March, several of those factories had been forced to close down due to lack of these resources. From a German perspective, this made it appear that passive resistance was working. However, even though it had not been as successful as hoped, the occupation policy was maintain had maintained the support of the French government and parliament. It was also disastrous for the German economy. The economic disruption, the social dislocation of the people, and just the cost of the government paying the strikers' wages was becoming problematic. A growing number within the German government believed that late spring was the time to negotiate before the strains of passive resistance began to fall apart. However, when negotiations were discussed with the French, they refused to meet any preconditions set by the Germans, like moving French and Belgian forces back to the demilitarized zone. And so the occupation, and therefore passive resistance, continued. <laughs> 
By the summer months, both sides were starting to question their actions. In Germany, the overall opinion became more and more critical of the government's actions, and, and even in France, questions began to be asked. Most of these questions came from the political left, and even those closer to the center were becoming concerned about the damage that was being done to the French economy. Prime Minister Poincaré, uh, sensing that he was losing support from some voters, reinforced his position on the right, which favored his hardline approach. He hoped that by pursuing this path, he would eventually bring the crisis to a victorious conclusion, which would take care of any lingering political problems. He would be uh, the great victor. Some more proposals would be made by the Germans in June. All of them tried to get around the problems that had caused the French to start the occupation without really giving in to them completely. Uh, this included the possibility of financing some reparations with foreign loans, uh, being more transparent with German economic records, or submitting the problem to a third power uh, for arbitration. All of these would be rejected by Poincaré and the French government. Uh, Sir Air Crow of the British Foreign Office would remark at this point that, quote, it looks as if those were right to believe Mr. Poincaré does not really desire a settlement, preferring to remain in the Ruhr and to see Germany reduced to impotence, as ends valued in themselves. The British government felt that they could not come down strongly on either side of this disagreement. They didn't really agree with what the French were doing, but they couldn't speak out against it. However, in August, as calls for action in London grew, Lord Curzon would publicly question the legality of French actions in the Ruhr. On the 11th of August, the British government would send a note to the French, where which uh, S Elspeth or Reardon summarizes in Britain and the Ruhr crisis. He would say, quote, a strongly worded note to France sharply criticizing French policy, declaring the occupation of the Ruhr to be illegal, and vaguely threatening some kind of unilateral separate action to hasten a settlement. Now, when this did not change the French stance, the British did not follow through with their threats. And honestly, while there was public support for the government to speak out against French actions, there was never enough support for drastic direct action. Another player in the international political chess was Italy. Now, Mussolini was already in power in Italy, and he'd initially supported the French actions. He was concerned that if Italy did not take a strong enough stance one way or another, it would be excluded from any agreement that would end the crisis. This was a great threat to Italy, um, and really the greatest threat to Italy to come out of this was an agreement between France and Germany that reduced the amount of German goods and material that could be exported to Italy. It's not an exaggeration to say that the Italian economy was totally dependent on German coal, and if that resource was cut off, there would be serious problems. There was also some hope that Italy could play the role of arbiter in the dispute, a position that Mussolini would try to put himself into several times during the 1920s and 30s. In the end, Italian participation in the eventual end of the crisis would be minimal. On August 12th, a decisive change would be made in the German government, and a new government would be created in Berlin. The expressed goal of this government was to end the passive resistance campaign, and they hoped to accomplish this by inviting the French to a multilateral peace conference. The hope was that by engaging with other nations along with the French, their demands would be softened. This didn't happen, and instead the new German leaders were forced to negotiate directly with the French. As part of this move to negotiate with them, a uh, passive resistance ended, a move that caused anxiety in Berlin due to concerns that such an action would end up causing more problems for Germany, fears that proved to be warranted. In the areas that had been occupied, there was widespread discontent, and while the passive resistance was over, French occupation continued. During the continued occupation, business leaders in the Ruhr would have to negotiate with the French, as well as with the government in Berlin. The French wanted to make sure that they established their ability and right to set taxes and to collect them, and they eventually landed on a number of 17.9. So 17.9% of total mine output would be handed over to the French. It was a steep price. But on some level, the mine owners and the workers and everybody involved just wanted the mines to start operating again, regardless of the cost. The mine owners were just as concerned with their negotiations with Berlin. The national German government had assured the mine owners that they would cover the costs that had been incurred during passive resistance, including the salaries of workers who participated. However, when this bill came due, the money simply was not available to pay it. All that the owners in the Ruhr got were promises of future payments, maybe hopefully.
This did nothing to endear the locals to the Berlin government. In fact, this period would see a rise in the popularity of the Rhenish separatist movement. The goal of this movement was the creation of an independent state made up of the Rhineland and the Ruhr. The official French position was that they would not impose the creation of such a state, but if, they, if the people wanted to go down that path, while well, the French weren't going to discourage them. Even this somewhat bland approach would come under fire from other nations in Europe who felt that such an action would just be too destabilizing for Germany and for Western Europe as a whole. While it appeared that the French had emerged victorious, the outcome of their occupation would not meet their expectations. For the entirety of 1923, they would receive just 263 million francs uh, in reparations, compared to 1.5 billion in 1922. The Ruhr occupation was not the only reason for this drastic reduction, but it was certainly a large contributor. When this paltry number was combined with other economic issues in France, 1924 would see the value of the franc collapse, and the French economic position continued to deteriorate. And still, through all of these problems, the French occupation of the Ruhr would continue. It would not be until August 1925 that it would end, and even at that late date, the evacuation was only thought possible due to the creation of the Dawes Plan. The Dawes Plan was the first of what would be several major changes to the reparations clauses in the Treaty of Versailles. It drastically reduced the expected reparations payments, especially in the short term, and provided Germany with large foreign loans. This agreement was only possible due to the pledges made by the German government to resume full reparations payments. The French were not necessarily happy about it, but they would eventually agree to move forward and to evacuate the Ruhr. Over the last year, I've given a lot of thought to where the story of the First World War ends. It's a very difficult thing to draw a line between war and peace, and I hope the last year of episodes have proven that. But I have come to the conclusion that, at least for most of the world, 1923 is the end of that story. And for Western Europe, the Ruhr crisis and the collapse of passive resistance in the Ruhr and then the eventual end of French occupation signifies that end. By the end of 1923, what I would consider the next story has already begun. Mussolini and the fascists are already in power in Italy. Russia is firmly under communist leadership. The Entente are uneasily moving into the post-war years, with the British Empire once again trying to distance itself from continental entanglements and the French searching desperately for allies. In Eastern Europe, many of the nations that would survive until 1939 are already in place. The United States had already withdrawn from further international commitments, and in the Far East, tensions were already rising between Japan and China. Oh, and in Germany, a group of radical reactionaries would launch the Beer Hall Push in November 1923. It would fail, but that would not prevent their leader from eventually rising to the leader of all of Germany, plunging the world into another world war. Even though I consider the story of the First World War over at this point, that does not mean this podcast is over, at least not quite yet. Next week, there will be a question and answer episode. There are currently 18 questions on the list. If you send me your question before December 1st, I will do my best to get it answered. Then, over the following five days, I'm going to release five previously Patreon-only episodes for reasons I'll describe in an introduction to those episodes. The short version is that I think the topics are too important to be locked behind a paywall. Then, after those five episodes, the actual last episode of History of the Great War will be released, with the primary topic being the legacy of the war and how it's been remembered over the years. As always, thank you for listening, and I hope you will join me next episode as we dive in to your questions. I pick on